couple of favourites. Ephesians 6, 1 to 9. A passage which I'm sure we know quite well, which I referred to a bit last week because really uh, last week and this week are two continuous, uh, continuous items, aren't they? Where they're looking, Paul's looking at authority and submission. And we're just going to look at this under four pretty obvious headings. We're going to think about children. We're going to think about parents, we're going to think about slaves, and we're going to think about masters. And we'll just jump straight in to that first heading, which is children, and hopefully it might be a little bit more interesting than we think. In Roman culture um, of the day, back when Paul was writing this, children were not celebrated. Okay? You know, they come in, Michael and Moses and Ada. And we all, yeah, we, we're all pleased, aren't we, that the children are here. You know, we, we pray at the beginning of the service that, that they'll get here for Sunday school on time and so on. We're, we're pleased to have the children here. That wasn't what it was like in Roman times. They were an inconvenient to the lifestyle that Roman culture celebrated. Jesus himself had already challenged everyday thinking back in to a first century Palestine. And it's recorded in Mark 10. He says, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then in Matthew 18, he's recorded as saying, And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. That was radical thinking. Children were just not that popular in those times. And in some cultures, it's true today, isn't it? Whilst the Victorians demanded that children be seen and not heard, I think it's fairly arguable that currently children who are not seen and not heard are more favoured, certainly in some households. But Paul expects children to be part of the church. He wouldn't be talking about them if he didn't. But what duties does he give the children? Well, firstly, they must obey, mustn't they? And, and this is an incredibly strong word. The word used for wives was they should submit to their husbands in the Lord. But children must obey. They should obey their parents in the Lord. And Paul says, this is right. It's like he's emphasising it. He links it to the Ten Commandments where we have that, uh, that fifth one on our list over there, up on the wall. Honour your parents, honour your father and mother. The first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life. It's the natural order of things, isn't it? We would expect parents to have authority over their children, and equally, we would expect the children to be obedient. But Paul attaches a really positive consequence to obedience. That it may go well with you. That you may have long life. Now, we live in in-between times. The kingdom of God is both now and not yet. And consequently, the fulfilment of all God's promises is guaranteed in the not yet days of the kingdom. They may be fulfilled in this world, but that's not guaranteed. And there's a very simple example. And in that whilst a child may choose to follow the Lord Jesus and obey Christian parents without question, they're not exempt from the horror of terminal illness or fatal accident. Every day may be a day in which they are a blessing to their parents and to others, or a day that may bring great heartbreak. They may live more days than expected or not. But the promise will have eternal fulfilment. But moving away from that, should children obey non-Christian parents? Well, yes, so long as the parents are not stepping outside the God-ordained duties that we'll perhaps consider in a minute. Remember we said last week, didn't we, that uh, the the authority is as from God. So if the authority is not being applied as from God, then perhaps the, the submission or the obedience is therefore not 
doesn't have to follow suit. But certainly, the law would not recognise the church looking to undermine a parent's authority. However, children can discuss the expectations in a family with their parents if they choose. But God invests the authority over the children in their parents. When children reach adulthood, the relationship changes to one of complete equality as the roles of child and parent are no longer relevant. Whilst honouring our parents remains a commandment, obedience is linked to the lack of wisdom and maturity, and so is superseded. And that's a bit, perhaps a bit difficult, um, and, and I understand that that may be sort of, we think, well, surely, um, you know, we're expected, Paul says that, um, let's go back and I'll read it, Paul says, obey your parents in the Lord. I can't, with putting my hand on my heart, besides, my tick, tick, it's there, it's working, um, say that I would be, I think it's right for me to be obedient to my mother. I think it's right for me to honour my mother, and I should seek to be doing that all the time. But there are times when my mum can make unreasonable demands and forget that I've also got a grandchild that I need to think about as well, and children, and so on. So I think you know, that, that there's a balance there, isn't there? But I think that the authority and the obedience is to do with that lack of maturity. And as the child grows into an adult, then it becomes a more equal sort of relationship. But let's move on. Let's move on to parents. The Roman father um, was a, not the sort of character you would see sat in here, I'm sure. He held the full force of the law in his hands. He had absolute power over his family. He could sell them if he wanted to as slaves. He could make them work in his fields even with chains on them to stop them running off. The law was in his hands meaning he could punish as he liked. Even inflicting the death penalty on his children. The Romans had, had he even invested in fathers now, I've, I thought I'd try and work out how to pronounce this. This is some Latin. The best Latin I learned at grammar school was sed est rex. And if anybody knows Latin, that is completely and utterly wrong as a phrase. But when your name is Button, uh, sed means uh, but. I think you sort of get the idea. But I, I owe maybe vitae necessu. Oh, this is a good attempt, isn't it? It's the right of life and death, often shown through the killing of the newborn or the exposure of children. And Paul's writing into this scenario, which I, what I think is scary, is that the ultimate authority concept of fatherhood, um, perhaps even as far as that concept of having the, uh, of having life or death, holding life or death of an infant child in their hands, is not a totally alien approach to fatherhood today. Paul made clear in, in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 of Ephesians, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Then in chapter uh, 4, verse 6, he says, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul says that fatherhood originates with God and that this new life that creates a new society with new standards resulting in new relationships and in particular a new image of fatherhood will mean that things are different. This was quite a radical thing that Paul was suggesting around AD 60. Well, the Telegraph, I do do something else other than look at the news online, okay, during the week, but you know, I, I think it helps. The Telegraph published these words uh, during the week. It said this, calling God our Father is problematic, says Archbishop 
of York. 1,940 years or so later, the church is still struggling with the issue of fatherhood. Now, in fairness to Stephen Cottrell, if you read the article, I think the headline does not reflect well his opening remarks at the conference that was being reported. But the point is that the issues that Stephen Cottrell and myself and others will have maybe looked at and struggled through with Floyd McClung's book, which was first published back in 1984, The Father Heart of God, are still being openly discussed in church leadership circles today. Now, Archbishop Stephen's uh, comments are best considered in the light of his admission uh, also this week that there is a safeguarding crisis in the Church of England. 21st century Western fatherhood is still skewed with from Paul's expectations. And I'd suggest that it's a common problem across the world, not just in the UK. It's not hard, is it, to understand how the negative image of or imagery of fathers impacts on generation after generation as the child lives out what was done to them. But what is the duty of fathers, of parents, towards children, according to Paul? Well, Paul says that they should not exasperate their children. I saw you all. There was a bit of a, a murmur as they read it. Don't exasperate your children. Do not frustrate your children with no win options for them. You can probably guess that's the one from the message. That's how Peterson puts it. No win options. You know, you tell the child to do something or you give them two or three options and none of them they win at. But then probably you don't win either. Don't provoke them to anger. Do, do not irritate. Do not drive them to a point of resentment. Do not make trivial, trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive demands. Do not show indifference or favoritism. Setting out to cause any of these is hardly love in action, is it? Of course, parents and children will not always see eye to eye. But setting out to cause an angry response is not the duty of parenthood that Paul is calling for. Rather, he sees parenthood as an opportunity to bring up children in the training and instruction of the Lord. I think that's clearly a pattern that Jesus experienced, isn't it? At the age of 12, he stayed behind in the temple to discuss with the religious leaders. He's obviously been trained. Mark, who wrote the gospel and travelled with Paul and Barnabas, certainly seems to have been trained by his parents, doesn't he? The best that a parent can do is to train their children in the things of God. And that's why this sermon is entitled Training and no favourites. Train the next generation. If we don't train the next generation, where will the church end up? That's why we have Sunday school. Because that's part of our corporate responsibility, to train the next generation. But it's also Augusta and Ugo's responsibility to train the children, to train the next generation in the things of the Lord. So with the importance of bringing up children in the faith ringing in our ears, Paul moves on to slaves. Now, clearly, we can't just move from Paul discussing slaves and masters to the concept of employees and employers, especially as there's one employer on, uh, online there with Paul as an employer, and most of us have been employees. It's quite a, a big uh, jump, isn't it? And probably it would be an unjustifiable leap to make. No employer owns their employees, or if they do, and we know about it, we should be reporting the matter to the police as soon as possible, because that would be modern day slavery. However, this passage is in the word of God, and as Paul himself says to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. 
So even though we recognize that slavery, the owning of another, is intrinsically evil, there must be something for us to consider in this passage. The relationship under consideration is perhaps the most extreme that we can imagine. The slave has no rights, even less so than a child in Rome. But at least, the very least, all adults were children, and so have some understanding of, of what it was like to have been a child. Whereas those who owned slaves were very unlikely to have been a slave themselves. And all they would have seen was the disparity in the relationship. Equally, slaves will have come probably from a downtrodden and abused perspective on life. I wonder what you see on the screen. I don't know whether you can see it at home. Paul, we've got Elaine. Anisha was on there just now, I know as well. Don't know if anybody? Anybody want to tell me, what do you see? Yes, Frank? Well, I can see. Oh, one is very young, and the other is a woman, smiling, looking down. So we can see two people. Yeah? Can everybody see the two? Two faces, and again, on that one, similar sort of thing, isn't it? Two faces, um, but depending on your perspective, you're likely to see maybe different things with them. They're not quite as, as difficult an optical illusion as some are to see. But uh, slavery was much like that. If you grew up the child of a slave master your perspective would be very different to that of growing up as the child of a slave. Two faces, if you like, looking in very different directions at the same experience. And yet, Paul says this to the abused and to the violated, to the owned, obey with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Shall I read that again? Because that's an incredible list, an incredible direction that Paul gives to those who are oppressed. They should obey with respect and fear with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ, not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. It's full on obedience. It's not merely a nodding of head in the direction of obedience. This is to be wholehearted, not wishy-washy half-heartedness. It is to be obedience as if this is God they are owned by. It is to be obedience as if it is God who is giving the directions. It is to be entirely respectful. It is obedience even when not being watched. If this is the obedience that Paul is expecting as a duty from slaves... <coughs> Well, how much more so from employees? I think the key being that this obedience is based on us considering that it is as, as if we are working for the Lord, isn't it? We feel, you feel like being disrespectful to your boss? Who are you working for? You don't want to do an aspect of your job? Who are you working for? You don't fancy it so on Monday? Who are you working for? You get smart and insincere. Who are you working for? Of course, perhaps you want to say, but, but I don't work. Well, this may be just about us training the next generations, might not it? It may be the things that we say to those who are younger than us. Here, Paul is turning on, his, on its head the expectations that we might have. How in this most unequal of all relationships, can he talk about obedience and respect and sincerity? But of course, the gospel is 
a topsy-turvy gospel. And it shouldn't surprise us that Paul says that even in this relationship, God's reverse standards are going to apply. This is how we apply this. Elsewhere, Jesus speaks, doesn't he, of loving our neighbour as ourselves. We are in the topsy-turvy kingdom of God. We who lived as, as slaves to sin and death, have been set free by the death of Jesus. Our eternal relationship with our Creator is secure. We are expected to turn on its head the relationship with our earthly masters. And then, of course, Paul speaks to the masters, to whom he says, this is topsy-turvy for you too. Treat your slaves, treat your employees, as I've instructed them to treat you with respect and fear and sincerity of heart, just as you would Christ, not only to win their favour when their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, and then without threatening them. Why? Because of perhaps the most important line of all, I think, in this section. And it's this. Since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favouritism with him. All of the submission that we've talked about, all of the authority, I think comes down to this. We are all equal before God. God has no favourites. If there are no favourites when it comes to slaves and masters, then there are no favourites when it comes to children and parents, or when it comes to husbands and wives. Paul has outlined here in this passage, the, and last week, the necessity of order, and the subsequent position of authority, and the need for submission to authority that is within the bounds of godliness. Remember Yoda, who I quoted last week, who said, Equality of worth is not identity of role. The roles we have may require submission to those in authority or the exercise of authority over others. But the moment we step away from realising that we are all made in the image of God and start thinking that somehow I'm better than you or I'm more important than them or I'm needed more than him, or I'm higher than her, then we lose credibility. And any God-given authority we may have due to the role God has placed us in is taken away. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed, but Yoda's statement also has an order, doesn't it? Equality of worth comes before identity of role. If you like, the identity we have from our role is submissive to the equality of, a, of all. Our role is to be obedient to the value we all have being made in the image of God. And my final words on this section regarding relationships will be paused. If we take nothing else away from the last two weeks looking at this practical application of our new life, in the new society, applying new standards through new relationships. It's this, that with God, there is no favouritism. Dave. 